This is Mish Monk coming to you with a special podcast. This one is answering your questions that you've posted on YouTube. So thanks for the support and enthusiasm for the Meganpedia podcast. I want to pop in and answer any questions that I've seen on YouTube comments. I'll do this after every few episodes. So please feel free to post those questions. A little housekeeping first. These episodes are for entertainment purposes. They are to stir the thoughts and present a wider angle on a topic with more inclusive information or as a new way to think about something. Or maybe the episode just tears apart preconceived ideas that were based on faulty logic or presumption. And that's okay too. So let's be clear. These are my opinions, and yes, they may be shared by most of you out there, but my analyses aren't going to stand up as the embodiment of an academic dissertation. My opinions aren't the total picture for stringent analytical standards. And I know this. Hence, I stress that it's for entertainment only. When I'm making a point, I'm looking for the source or context to bolster my opinion. Yes, I'm trying to influence you. Remember the play Hamilton the Musical? If you've seen it, the production is a mix of fiction and history for purposes of dramatic effect and delivery. Lynn manuel its creator, said that the point of his art, and for me, these podcasts, are for you to be excited to learn more and for you to do your own research or for you to discuss further among yourselves. I don't speak without a script. When I stray, you'll hear me pausing and going, uh, <laughs> because my brain freezes or too many thoughts are flooding the brain waves. A state of my fuzzy mind that is more of a thing nowadays. I work on my essay, which takes time to research and write and try to make it succinct. Then I read it a few times for delivery's sake. Most times, I have to tear it apart tear those sentences apart because while the flow works if reading silently, it doesn't flow when I have to read it out loud because my tongue trips over words. Sometimes I need to catch my breath and I'm not a techie, tech whiz with all the editing and so on. So it's mostly a one take read through. And my hope is that no one in the house yells for me, that the neighbor's hound dog doesn't start his ungodly barking, and that the roar of a motorcycle or car doesn't interrupt my reading. If you haven't listened to all the episodes, I suggest starting from episode one, because although the topics are not linked, I do include bits and pieces about me, which just adds a bit of layered context to my opinions. I know the first two episodes might be a little low in volume, but hopefully we have fixed that. So episode three and onward should be easier to hear. So let's begin. Episode one was Megan is not the problematic one. Now, I didn't see any questions, so I will talk about what inspired me to talk about this episode, this topic. And it was that the piling on on Megan was just too much. If you walked in on this drama with no context, no backstory, you'd think this woman was the worst thing ever. Here's her father and the rest of the Markle clan ripping her apart, siding with the queen. You have the royals and the aristocracy who act cold toward her. It looks like they don't even want to be around her or say anything about her. And the media paints her as a disingenuous fake, this loser with her acting career, who hoodwinked their favorite British son of Dear Princess Die. And then you have the bots and the haters, which could be the same. They're also an element of, well, she knew what she was getting into, so she gets what she deserves. Or... She's a celebrity. She's got thick skin. She doesn't need sympathy. Or she's an actress. She knows how to look sad. This movement of solidarity about and for Megan has a bigger purpose, in my opinion. 
Megan inadvertently has become a symbol of what has been rejected or deemed not good enough for the society. She and what she represents pushes against identity politics of race, gender, and even the immigrant life. As I speak up on behalf of Megan, I'm not speaking for her. She's quite capable and remarkable with that. I'm speaking up for the young girls and women like myself who wear some or all of those identities and constantly do triple the work for a smidgen of the credit and recognition and always through the lens of suspicion and revulsion. Check out the U.S. political landscape for how quickly an immigrant becomes persona non grata. Moving on to episode two, it was Dear Kate Middleton, Let's Chat. For this episode, I wanted to elevate the powerful insight and commentary that came from James Baldwin. And I would like to recommend a great documentary on the U.S. uh, Amazon Prime, I'm Not Your Negro. It's a 93-minute feature documentary narrated by Samuel L. Jackson, and it's inspired by Baldwin's unfinished manuscript, Remember This House, which is a collection of notes and letters written in the mid-1970s. It wasn't a stretch to use his quotes as a condemnation of America's racist history and his unvarnished opinions for what Megan is undergoing under another racist institution that has shaped and influenced not only America, but the world. But with this podcast, I also wanted to address Kate because, well, I got triggered by her. We sometimes overuse this word, where words go in and out of fashion after we've been clobbered over the head with its use. So yes, I was triggered. With everything that led up to the Commonwealth Day at the church, I was feeling pretty good about Megan and Harry's final farewell. That is, until they walked into the church and were taken to their seats instead of being part of the procession. Just didn't sit well with me. It was the firm's final act to mitigate their show of disrespect to Megan, who's the vice president of the Commonwealth Trust, and a person of color. But no, they couldn't do that much. Then the blatant vile behavior of Kate and Sophie, two grown women acting petty, fueled my rage. Now I was livid. So when the various cultural performances of the Commonwealth, who we know are mainly people of color, were underway, I could see on the TV screen these stone-faced royals. And no, that's not stoicism. That's a privileged emotional disconnect to the moment. They could give a bleep about what was happening in front of them, what was happening for them. If there was a cartoon animator, they would draw thought bubbles over their head of their bitterness just stewing there, while their mouths stayed pinched with displeasure. And they stayed that way through the entire ceremony. Do you know how much energy it takes to stay mad? You've got to keep reminding yourself that you're mad. Think about when you were a kid and you were mad with a sibling or even your parent. It didn't last. As adults, We hang on to the anger because we keep feeding the beast to keep it relevant. And I know there are important things to be angry about in the world or with people like abusers. But you get my point. That clique stayed mad throughout the ceremony. And while William is a pompous goat, you'd think on the other hand a mother, especially of young kids, would be kind and compassionate in the same way she treats and expects her kids to be treated. Now, I can be guilty of being a Pollyanna. I grew up on a steady diet of the sound of music that somehow just hasn't been embraced by my kids once they were old enough to just walk out the room when it was on TV. Or maybe it was just me singing and performing that kind of killed it for them. But Kate that day looked like a frigid popsicle. And Sophie, oh my goodness, she's too old to be acting the fool. So I wanted my chance after the hoopla had died down over this event to have my say. I wanted to open the door to my anger so it can exit and I don't have to suffer a negative reaction by that woman ever again. Because now she's dismissed. 
So let's look at one of the questions that I got. It says, does she, meaning Kate, even have the capacity to understand what you're saying? Now, this was a rhetorical uh, question, but I'll answer. <laughs> yes, I do think that Kate is intelligent enough to understand. Now, whether she agrees that she's part of the problem is questionable, but I'll take the liberty of projecting my thoughts on her circumstance. Because you see, she is in a gilded cage. Even if she voluntarily stepped in and closed the door behind herself, she's now locked in and she has squashed any ambitions that might have formed as a young adult to suit someone else's life purpose, namely Williams. Whatever her title will be and the attention that she garners, she is not Williams' equal. Her son George has more importance than her. She matters no more because the line to the throne excludes her. Heck, it never included her and the survival of the monarchy also excludes her. Yeah, if she divorces William, it will be a scandal. But the media and royalists will go into overdrive to spit and polish the royal image. Done once, and it would be done again. So her purpose has been completed. She produced an heir with a couple spares. And this is me being harsh. This is the condition of the cage. She, like Anne, Betty's daughter, will become single focus on their life job with the occasional bursts about George graduating, George going to university, George's girlfriend's George's marriage. No one will care about Kate other than what she's wearing and whether she was gracious or in keeping with royal standards. So she will understand through those quiet moments about what she has missed out on in life and in not cultivating a friendlier relationship with Megan. I remain optimistic in my fantasy, so just leave me alone. <laughs> we had a comment on here. It says, Megan could and would have been her biggest and best ally, and I agree wholeheartedly. I had hoped that they would have been the outcome of the brothers and their wives that that whole ally and friends would have been the thing. That scenario of a Fab Four is a good Hallmark movie. But as you lift up the carpet and look into the darkness, you see the stage is set as if it's a Games of Thrones scene with backstabbing and sabotaging efforts in full measure from the future future king against his brother. The wives could have been allies and even be instrumental in healing the rift, but Kate took a step back from Harry and their friendship to be 100% loyal to her husband, who, <laughs> his loyalty is pretty suspect, to her. Someone shared a quote for this part, and it says, What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will he give in exchange for his soul? Well, there you go. We're seeing the drama play out. Moving on to episode three, the latest episode. It was, They Wish We Were Sheep. Now, my inspiration for this most recent episode was the avalanche of headlines generated about Harry and Meghan. The double standards that Meghan endured in comparison to Kate and the targeted attacks that cross media platforms as if all under the power of a single orchestral conductor. With similar actions from the media occurring in the U.S., I wanted to get my thoughts down on what is happening and why it's happening to all of us who consume the media's news without objective thought. It's not about saying that we must be critical for critical sake because who's got the time to fact check everything? But on the other side, don't be too complacent either when information is placed in front of you and pay attention to talking points that mirror each other over all platforms. So the question that I got here was, how are the Commonwealth countries going to take on this situation? 
and it leaves more room for discussion, but the damage is done. Well, in my opinion, the Commonwealth countries will not have a unified reaction to their relationship with the UK. You can look at the CARICOM, which is a cooperative and economic Caribbean member community establishment, and you can see the individual interests at play or in conflict with each other. And even when the various countries criticize elements of the England's, UK's racist past or current behavior, these countries are not necessarily going to break it off for a variety of reasons that come down to economics and access to bigger markets. The Commonwealth didn't need Meghan's issues to be their deal breaker to leave. They had and still have the Windrush scandal, among other issues, to be their motivation. And what has happened after that? You know, what, what have we seen from the Windrush scandal? Otherwise, these countries will continue to welcome the royals to visit their hospitals and share in military exercises. And for some countries, it's the magical time that they bother to fix their roads and splash paint on their public buildings for the royals versus for their own people. So that's what, my, what, that's what I think about the Commonwealth. Now, another question was, will this pass over the top of the heads of the no-brainers and haters? We're in a time where folks are pretty entrenched in what they believe. Those who hate, or for those who prefer a softer word, let's say dislike, not feel comfortable with, feel something off about Megan, they will not believe that they have been led to hate and demean this woman. And there's inherent bias built on a daily diet through privileged, racist educational systems and rigid exclusion from the governing and economic tables that produces the haters of others, haters of women, haters of disruptors of royal sensibilities, haters of black and brown bodies. Each of those issues come loaded to cause automatic responses with negative behavior and emotions. So just a photo of Megan can have someone foaming at the mouth, ready to talk about what they don't like about her physicality. Hearing Megan speak at an event can sometimes make someone scream on social media that she only wants to hear herself speak and she thinks she's so intelligent. They may even complain that they don't like the sound of her voice. Further, someone praising Megan can cause people to dig deep in their racist bag to pull out insults as to why Megan is a con artist that the very idea that someone likes and admires her gives them an ulcer. Haters, if they can stand to listen to this episode, would be a bubbling volcano of anger because they aren't emotionally involved, evolved, and intellectually open to hear the message. But saying all that, look at some who are stepping forward now to defend Megan when they were silent before. Sometimes it takes seeing a rising tide for the less courageous to slip into the mass as if they were already there, because it's more about them than about Megan. I also think that although the tabloids will screech their nonsense for the Brits, the physical distance that Megan has with the country will also provide distance necessary for some consciences to be, to be pricked into a wake-up moment. It reminds me of when this mean girl from my high school days reached out to me on social media uh, to hang out. And while I hadn't lingered over the memories of her until she reached out and it all came back, I had zero desire to catch up. I was no longer the foreign girl with the accent who dressed and looked different. But maybe her conscience may have finally kicked in. So there's hope for some, but don't hold your breath. So in closing, there was one comment that I particularly wanted to address. And the commenter wrote, I do take exception to you grouping all people of color in the UK not supporting Megan. 
I and many others have been supporting her from the beginning, writing to the tabloids, contacting radio phone-ins, arguing with people on trains, cabs, planes, trams, buses, and even in supermarket aisles. I want to clarify that I specifically spoke about those people in the public sphere because they have influence on their various platforms. I had gone as far as putting names down, and then when I researched, I saw that some of the people who I thought hadn't defended Megan had done so on other platforms outside of social media. To repeat what I'd said, and thank goodness for my script, I said, but Megan, thank goodness, had a lot of good people. And when I say good, I don't extend that to people who are sympathetic but don't have the courage to open their mouths. There were a lot of POC celebrities, journalists, authors who said nothing, didn't tweet support, didn't criticize the royals, were punks and sacrificed nothing to lift up Megan. And then my other comment was, part of my other comment was, and for the people of color, the British coons, the Uncle Toms, the self-hating bitches who willingly step up to be the plantation overseers, may your soul never know a moment's peace until you have a come-to-Jesus moment. Both, again, are very specific to whom I'm referring. So, to the commenter, based on your own admission, you and others have supported Megan. Therefore, my comments didn't apply to your commendable efforts. So I'm going to use the overused word here, don't get triggered off the wrong things and miss the big picture. But until the next time, this is Mishmunk saying peace out. <laughs>